has sent me their Zima Blade 770 model, which features the same Intel N3450 CPU as their Zima board 432 and 832 models. One notable difference is the RAM module is not soldered on to the motherboard like the Zima board. So for the Zima Blade, you can install up to a 16 gigabyte RAM module. So that's one thing that's uh, different between the two models. Another thing is you get one less gigabit ethernet port. So that's something to keep in mind, but you can add on additional ports by using the PCI Express external slot that they have, just like the Zima board, the Zima Blade has that same external PCIe slot. So you can expand the amount of interfaces that you want to use on the Zima Blade, just like the Zima board. So as you can see, here is the Zima Blade. You'll notice the PCIe slot on the side here. You get a USB 3.0 port on the front and a type C port for the power. And you get one ethernet connection as well as one mini display port connection. And on the back, you get two SATA ports with a five volt power connection that can power both drives at the same time. Here's a size comparison to the Zima board and a Raspberry Pi, so you can get kind of perspective of how small the Zima blade is. It's not much bigger than a Raspberry Pi that would be if it was in a case. So in addition to sending me the Zima blade 770, they sent me the entire NAS kit, which comes with this nice little enclosure. You can put two three and a half inch hard disks in it. And it came, it came with the dual SATA cable, which you can connect to both hard drives, and it has one single power cord. That's what I mentioned on the back of the Zima Blade. You would just plug that in, and it can set right on top of this enclosure for these hard drives. And so you can just plug these three cables into the back of the Zima Blade, and you have a self-contained little NAS system that you can expand if you want some additional network interfaces, you can pop one on the side here. For an example, for expanding the network interfaces, I have this 2.5 gig NIC, look how small this one is. I just took the front plate off. It doesn't really stick off real far. It looks kind of interesting. It's a, you know, if you do it like this, if you want to have an extra interface, if I put it on this enclosure, it just kind of barely hangs over the edge because it's a very compact NIC. So the project I have in, in mind for the Zima Blade NAS kit is to set up a TrueNAS replication target. So instead of setting it up just as a TrueNAS ser uh, server, which you could do as your main primary NAS, I want to set it up as a secondary TrueNAS box that I can use just to replicate uh, my most important data sets to it. And so I, I feel like this will be a nice low power backup solution in addition to some other backup mechanisms I already have in place. So let's get started with setting up TrueNAS on this box and then we'll have, hopefully by the end of this video, we'll have a low power backup. So now I'm booting up the Zima Blade. Normally it has a logo there, full screen logo, but I disabled it so I can see what's happening. I'm using Ventoy right now to install TrueNAS Scale. So we'll, we'll just boot in normal mode and we'll see what happens here. All right, TrueNAS Scale installation. Nothing crazy going on here. This will just be a standard TrueNAS installation. And I'll show you how to set it up as a replication target. Now it says install or upgrade, so we're going to install. We're going to install this on the built-in EMMC storage, which is 32 gigs. Of course, the actual storage is more like 29 gigs, I guess. It shows it right there. So we just hit spacebar to mark that first drive, the EMMC drive, and then we'll hit OK. This will erase everything. That'll be good. The web UI authentication method we want to have an administrative user instead of the root user, which is the you know, newer default for TrueNAS scale. So it'll set up an admin user. Let's set up a password. We'll just wait for it to extract and we'll just, I'll speed this part up. All right, so now it says the TrueNAS installation on the MMC storage is has succeeded. So now it says, please reboot and remove the installation medium. So I'm going to take out the thumb drive real quick and I'm going to reboot this. Okay, so it looks like whenever it's done booting up, it brings you up to the console.
setup here if you wanted to configure TrueNAS for the console, which is pretty convenient. So that, that wasn't too bad. I'm looking at the time of our recording so far. It's only been 11 minutes from the time that I booted this up, installed it, and rebooted the system. So that's pretty quick. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to switch over to the web interface and we'll get it configured to get our drives configured. And then I'll be able to set up the replication target on my primary TrueNAS. So then I'll be able to use this as a secondary backup. So now I've opened the web interface for the TrueNAS installation that's on the Zima Blade. I'm going to sign in with admin is the username and the password you enter during the installation. All right, so here's the TrueNAS dashboard. It's a nice looking little dashboard. Let's go to storage and I should be able to create a data pool with my two hard disks that I have. If you didn't do it already beforehand, you can erase the disks. Let me show you real quick. If you go to storage and you go to disks, you can come in here and open up one of the hard disks and you can go to wipe. So I actually did that ahead of time so I don't have to show you that part. So let's go back to storage and create a pool. I'm going to just call it, you know, I don't know, you can call it whatever you want, replication um, pool. Yeah, I'll just call it replication pool because uh, that's basically what it's going to be used for. And I'm going to click next. They have this little wizard you can kind of walk through. So now you pick the layout, and normally if you have two drives, you would mirror them, and that's what I recommend doing. But just for demonstration purposes and for, and for my purposes, since this is a backup and not my main TrueNAS storage, I am going to stripe them because I want 8 terabytes of storage because the data set that I want to back up is 5 terabytes. Whenever I get larger disks or something, I, I might just redo this pool and just redo the re replication you know, task because this is just an extra backup. I already have a USB backup. I just want to emphasize that Striping your drives is not what I recommend doing. <laughs> because if you lose one drive, you lose both drives worth of data. Let's go to the automated disk selection. Well, you know, there's not much uh, choice for it because there's only two four terabyte drives. <laughs> so that would be great. And the width is going to be two because I'm going to use striping with two discs because if, if I did the width of one you'll see there's still one disc left so you want the width to be two and one VDEV you know it's all you can create with that so there you go and it says a stripe VDEV is highly discouraged and will result in data loss if it fails uh, so we're going to save and go to review and so uh, you notice like it, when we did that it skipped all these other optional steps because these these optional steps are more advanced zfs configurations and we're ready to create the pool and it's giving you a red it changed from orange to red to say it's highly discouraged so they really don't want you to do this but we're going to do it anyway i'm glad they let you do it anyway you know you can shoot yourself in the foot if you want and zfs and TrueNAS will let you do it they try to warn you but they'll let you do it so <laughs> let's go ahead and create that data pool that's a very dangerous and risky data pool and we're going to do it anyway. We're living on the edge right here, right now. All right, so now that we created, you'll see our usable capacity is 7.13 terabytes. And so now we actually have, you know, both those drives combined into one big data pool for our backup. Okay, before we get started with the replication task, uh, one thing we need to do on our replication server that we're using, now that we got the pool set up, we just need to go to system settings, uh, services, and then we just need to enable SSH. And then we need to go to the credentials and we're going to go to local users. And then we're gonna to go to the admin user because this is gonna be our non-root admin user, which is set up by default um, with when you did the installation. We wanna click edit. And we're going to go scroll down to here where it says, allow all sudo commands with no password. So this allows you to run uh, some of the root commands without having to enter a password, which is necessary in order to do replication. So we're still not using the root user, but this allows us to um, behave more like the root user where we don't have to type in a password every time we want to do a privileged command. So, um, okay, now that we did that, let's jump over to the uh, main TrueNAS server and we'll set up the replication task and we'll see how that works. Okay, on my main node, we just need to go to the credentials and the backup credentials, and we're going to create an SSH connection. You can do this when you create the replication task, but we might as well go ahead and do it in here just so that we can just 
get it out of the way. I'm just gonna call this uh, true NAS you know, replication uh, target, okay? And then we can say semi-automatic, which means you can use your true NAS URL to sign in with some other additional information. This kind of lets it set up some of the, uh, I guess, configuration. Uh, it makes it a little bit easier, I guess, to do it that way. So I'm gonna do HTTPS, and it was type in the IP address or host name of the server we're connecting to. So I'm just gonna do 1.22. And then since we're not using the root user, we're using the admin user. We need to type in the admin username and password. And then we're gonna do username down here. Is also admin, because this is your login. This is your web login right here. And this is the username that's gonna be running the process once you're logged in. Uh, I guess if you're doing SSH, it's gonna log in via SSH. Um, let's see, you have to pick a private key. I already have a key generated on the server because so I can log in SSH to my TrueNAS server. And you could just generate one here. So let's click save. Okay, when you click save, you'll you'll you probably see this uh, error that you can't verify the certificate because it's a self-signed certificate. You can actually just close this and then hit confirm and continue, and it'll still work fine. If you're on a local trusted network, it's not super critical that you get a, a, a certificate on there that's not self-signed. But if you want maximum security, it's best to to set up a certificate in there so when it goes to verify that it can be more trusted, okay? So I'm just gonna do this for demonstration purposes. I'll leave that as an exercise for you if you wanna do that. Let's go to data protection, and we're gonna scroll down to replication tasks and click add. And we're saying we're gonna say the source is on this system. I'm gonna replicate, uh, let's see, we'll go down to, I'm gonna replicate my next cloud data set. Let's try that, okay? And then we'll go to destination. It's gonna be on a different system. And we're gonna select our SSH connection that we just created. Okay, and then it's gonna say use uh, sudo for or sudo for S ZFS commands. So because we're not using the root user, we need to do that. So we'll just, we'll just check that. And we need to pick our destination, which I just, you know, remember we created that replication pool. So we just, that's the only one we have available to pick here. So we'll just click that. So we're not worried about setting up encryption on the destination, nor are we worried about transferring the data with encryption because I'm doing it on the local network. I'm not sending it over the internet like I mentioned before. So it's on a trusted network anyway, sending between two machines. You can you can save on some CPU resources and it can be uh, maybe transfer your data a little faster. So let's go ahead and say no encryption. You can decide which you know which option you want if you want maximum security or not. And and you can give the task a name or whatever. So I'm just gonna leave it for now just because it doesn't really matter uh, what it, you call it. And then you can run this on a schedule or one time. Uh, some, some people do one time replication, I guess, if you wanna just get it there off site or whatever. Um, but you can set a schedule here to whatever you want it to be. I'm just gonna hit save just so I can demonstrate how this works. So now we'll just run this job and you can see what it looks like when it's running. And as I say, replicate now, and it says it started. And uh, if we go up to our jobs, you can see that this replication is running, this replication task, and it's sending the data over. So that's all you need to do to get uh, replication running. Hope you guys enjoyed this little project I did with the Zenoblade to show you some examples of some things you could do in your home lab with this type of hardware. Uh, this is a nice low cost uh, alternative to like getting a Raspberry Pi or uh, even, even some other mini PCs. I, I feel like this is like a nice low price point because this whole entire kit costs less than some mini PCs. And it probably costs almost as much as a Raspberry Pi once you buy all the accessories to build an ass like this. The, these accessories are pretty affordable. So I hope you enjoyed this video. And until next time, I'll see you guys in the next video.